All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm Rob. And I'm Lee. And this is the China Literature Podcast. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a story called Zhongxingge Chonghui Zhenzhushan. In English, known as Zhang Xingge, re-encounters his pearl-sewn shirt. From a collection of stories, which in English is called Stories Old and New. It was written in the late Ming Dynasty. 1620, right? Yeah, I believe it was published in 1620. Um... Feng Long Long, the author of this text, wrote it and then died about 25 years later in I believe, 1645. I'm fairly certain it was published in 1620, yeah. 1620. And, and he wrote it, quote, unquote. Uh, a lot of these stories are what we call rewrites. And it was not, because it was not uncommon back then to take an, a story that was already a story in classical Chinese and then sort of put your own spin on it. Kind of like a cover song idea. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they became very, very different. Uh, this is a good example of that. I think cover song makes it sound like it's just taking the words and putting them in someone else's mouth. Mm. This is a bit... Di- I mean, so the story... One of the stories we've read was essentially a cover version. But this story was quite different. The classical Chinese, which those of y'all who are into this, we're talking about Wen Yin Wen. Mm-hmm. There's a Wen Yin Wen version of the story that he's drawing, that Feng Long Long is drawing off of. And that's like three or four pages, whereas this is maybe 30 pages. Yeah. We were, we were surprised by the length. Uh, if you're used to reading classical pieces, you're used to, by and large, each individual piece being fairly short and concise. Uh, even a very, very, very long work is usually composed in short bits. Mm-hmm. This is a very long, sustained narrative. And Feng Long Long is doing stuff. He's adding stuff to this this story i'll give you i'll give you an example he's adding names the original classical story didn't have names so when mm. feng long long writes it or translates it however we want to conceive of that he's doing something much more than just <laughs> even a translation it's somewhere in between in, in terms of creativity i'd say it's somewhere in between translation and and original composition yeah and, 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 and this is really isn't even a new phenomenon. I mean, no. uh, a lot of Western literature is the same, even up to, say, Ulysses by Joyce, which he's taking the shell of a story with actual events and reframing them completely. Well, I mean, if you think about, like, Chaucer, hmm. Chaucer's Knight's Tale is essentially a, it's exactly a retelling, a retelling of a Boccaccio tale. Yeah, and then to take it into the modern era, someone like Dan Simmons, who's a science fiction fantasy whatever writer, writes a, a book called Hyperion, which is a retelling in itself of Canterbury Tales. Same plot structure, but set on a foreign world with eight or nine travelers is completely different stories, but the idea is exactly the same. And so Feng Meng Long just puts himself in that tradition. Hmm. Um, it is a very good story. Yeah. Surprisingly. Like yeah. I wish I should say surprisingly, but this is belongs to a genre of fiction in uh Ming Qing uh China. It's just called Huaban or vernacular fiction. We'll probably talk some more about these Huaban. Yeah. There's a lot of Huaban. And I'm a I'm a sort of a novice in this. This is my first go round with a lot of this stuff, and so it's been interesting to read it. Mine too. Um a lot of what I'm used to with classical we say classical. When I say classical, in my mind, I'm thinking anything before about 1895. Right, but that's a very problematic right. it is. way. Because essentially what Rob is doing is he has been educated by the modern mainland Chinese, I'll say it, communist <gasps> apparatus. Um, I, of course, was also educated under that apparatus, but I... Found salvation. He was liberated. I was he liberated. was liberated. Jay <laughs> Fong <laughs> This is hilarious because when I studied this stuff, the the, the party line, both figuratively mean, and literally, yeah. the party line, is that in 1919, which is when Lu Xun publishes his uh, Ren, uh, the, uh, Diary of a Madman, which we've already discussed, um, that's the beginning of, of modern or of, of colloquial fiction. Vernacular fiction appears in 1919. Before that, there's nothing. Right? <laughs> it's a wasteland of classics. Just a wasteland of highbrow elitist crap. And then you read this and you, and you say, well, but this is extremely vernacular. There's 
it's still the grammar is still very much not modern. Mm-hmm. But there's so many things in here that are clearly not highbrow fiction. Uh, my favorite scene, just to give it away, not favorite scene, but the one that made me go, what? Yeah. Is a fortune teller comes to the door of a family's house, and one of the, the serving women is said to be peeing. She's in the middle of, yeah, defecating. She's in the middle of peeing, not defecating, peeing. Oh, I remember this. Don't ask me why I remember exactly peeing. But I, I think do. we all know. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm fixated on him. And um, she's in the middle of peeing when this guy answers the door. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but you got to bear in mind, this is only a 20-something page story. So each detail counts. Why would you need to describe a woman peeing as the door is not, you know, someone knocks on the door? Yeah. Uh, and there are she reasons She was doing this. something while this guy, I, I think he was she actually was busy. Just passing yeah. by yeah. and she heard him. Yeah, that's it. He didn't knock. You're right. He didn't knock. And then she went out to get him. So she had to rush to go get him. But she could have been doing anything. You're absolutely right. She could have been doing anything. Why is she peeing? What do you think? And for me, I when I hear that, I, I think comic relief. I, I, the only thing, I, I keep I coming think, back to this. I think for, for me, it's it's almost pornographic. It is. But it, in the same way, and this is, I got to throw this out there because this is what I thought of as soon as I read it. The gatekeeper scene in Macbeth. Just after Macbeth mm. has killed the king... The very next scene is someone banging on the castle gates, and this gatekeeper who's dead drunk, stumbling through the courtyard after taking a leak. And it's hysterical. It's so funny. And that's just anything involving bodily functions in the middle of an otherwise extremely serious story, I read as funny. Okay. Um, I want to go with the pornographic line a little, if that's okay. Because there is a scene in this story... That is fairly pornographic. Should we go ahead and let's go ahead and give this the plot structure and everything? And then we'll, we'll get we'll get back to the pornography. We right. are sure the listener. We should we should just do a whole series on Chinese porn. We we have so many listeners. Get Ye in here. She's doing her dissertation. That's so true. Yeah, we could do a whole podcast on ch- classical porn. Yeah, let's um, do it. <laughs> well, let's do it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> let's talk about it. Crazy. Let's clarify. Um, so. So what happens in this story? So in this story, the very beginning, well, we'll talk about the very beginning in a second, but the basic story is uh, a guy named Jiang Xingge, who is the son of a merchant, and he's taken around with his father on merchant trips and stuff. And when he comes back, his father wants to make sure he's taken care of, so wants him to be wed to a local family's daughter. But then the father dies. And in Confucian culture, you were supposed to wait, what is it, 27 months? 27 months. 27 months to mourn the dead. You're not allowed to engage in any kind of sexual relations for those 27 months. If you're married, you're not allowed to have sex. If you are not married, you're not allowed to get... Yeah, yeah. Um, The son is encouraged by certain people, certain friends, to go ahead and get married anyway. At some point in this 27 months. And he does. Uh, The family of the daughter sort of agrees and they get married and they're blissfully happy this is not a a a detail you often see in descriptions of marriage in chinese fiction but they're supposed to be blissfully happy and yeah he stays he claims that he's mourning his so they get married i guess after one year and he claims he's mourning his father so he doesn't leave the house right but in fact he's just having a little love fest yeah exactly he says i'm not leaving the house so, there's plenty of stuff to do in the house, mind you. But, mm. um, so, they're blissfully happy. But at some point he realizes, no, I actually do need to travel and oversee my father's business and the contacts we have down south. His wife says, no, don't go. He says, oh, okay, I'll wait another year. And then a year goes by and he says, no, seriously, I have to go. This is ridiculous. And so he, he leaves, but he promises to be back in the spring. So, and he's he, going to be gone for a year. He promises, I'm going to be back. When that tree blooms again. And he tells his wife, now you're beautiful, so don't go showing yourself at the window. Because people are just going to want to you know, rush in and yeah, stay away from the window. Well, she doesn't. And she's seen by a passerby who resembles her husband. And he decides his life is going to end unless he can have sex with her. That's it. And so he gets a go-between to arrange this whole thing. And in this... I would argue Shakespearean or Boccaccian scene. Um, this happens. The tryst actually happens. We'll have to narrate it more. It's a lot of detail, so we can't narrate the whole thing. And right I now. think I think the details aren't really necessary. But let's 
let's just go ahead and get to the... They consummate the tryst, right. Yeah. And so, but in a twist, in, in one of the weirdest moments in the story, instead of going, oh my gosh, what have I done? My husband's going to kill me. I'm in love with my husband. They immediately fall madly in love, mm-hmm. right? Well, then he has to leave too. And she says, she, they're both terribly sad. And she says, well, I'll tell you what, take with you this heirloom from my husband. It's a shirt sewn together with pearls. It's supposed to be cool in the heat. I'm not sure why, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> and he's desperately sad too, but takes the shirt and travels off. And, in perhaps another Shakespearean twist, who does he meet on his travels but Don Don? Zhang Chinga. The husband. And they're drinking one night, oblivious to who the other person is, and they're drinking, and they're drunk, and finally the guy with the pearl sewn shirt says, hey, let me show you something cool. Shows him the pearl sewn shirt, and the husband says, wait a freaking minute. I know that shirt. Something bad has happened, and I think I know what it is. And then the uh, the uh, adulterer, I don't mm-hmm. know if he's technically an adulterer, he gives it to him, and he's like, hey, I have this lover back in... Oh, right. No, he doesn't give him the shirt. He gives him a token to take back with him, right? No, he gives her the, the shirt. shirt. He okay. gives him the shirt, yeah. Right. Because that's how he is, uh, that's how Zhang Xing the, uh, Zhang Xingge is eventually able to show it to his wife and be like, what's up? Right. Let's get a divorce. Which is, in fact, exactly what happens when he goes back. And I don't want to... How does it end up? Take yeah. us through the rest of the second half. So, so he divorces her. Um, he marries another, he marries another woman. This woman turns out to be the widow of the guy who had an adulterous affair with his wife. And then uh, the woman who, uh, who gave away the pearl sewn shirt, her name is Sancha, and she is divorced. She's kind of embarrassed. She marries a judge. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would call him a magistrate. Magistrate. And, um, he, you know, is very nice to her. Then this magistrate receives a case where her former husband, Zhang, Xing, uh, Zhang Xingge, is brought before his court. And for whatever reason, they find out what happened. And the magistrate just happily gives away his wife and back, back to Zhang Xingge. And so Zhang Xingge is rewarded, sort of, with two wives. He has two wives. He comes out. It's a happy ending, sort of. I mean, we could argue that it's not. But, right. Well, I mean, we can discuss that later. Yeah. But, but anyways, can we get to the porn? We'll talk about the porn in a second. Uh, because it will relate to the, the, what I would like to talk about, um, which is the beginning of the story. Okay. Now, Lee and I disagree pretty strong. Well, not pretty strongly. It's not like we've come to no, blows no, no, we, over it. We have come to blows. We kind of blows our bottles have been broken, eyes have been gouged out. The very opening of the story is definitely uh, Fang Menglong's edition, and it's a long moralizing introduction. Well, long for Chinese standards. Moralizing mm-hmm. introduction, in which he's warning the audience against four vices mm-hmm. alcohol, lust, wealth, and rage. Mm hmm. This, I'm, by the way, I'm working with a translation of this story called Stories Old and New, a Ming Dynasty collection. And the translators are uh, Yang Shu Hui and Yang Yunxin. You can find it on Amazon. It's a really good translation. If, if you're at all interested in this, you should definitely try to find it. Um, anyway, this, this, this is the, the devices as they are translated into English. And then he says, but most important of all these vices is that of lust. Mm-hmm. Beware of lust. And then he gives this poetic couplet saying, um, I, I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but yeah. essentially, beware of lust. And the last line is literally, you know, if you cheat on your wife with someone else, they're going to cheat on your wife, etc. So there's this couplet uh, sort of admonishing the reader. And it says, the human heart may be blinded, but the will of heaven never errs. If I debauch not others' wives... Other men will not debauch mine. I should say, if I debauch not other men's wives, other men will not debauch mine. That he says, now I'm going to tell you a story that illustrates that. But does it really, I mean, overall, do you think that the story really illustrates that? Well, this is, this is what I was going to introduce as, a, as our discussion here. Okay. Because we mentioned the porn. So he gives this introduction. I'm going to tell you a story about why lust is bad and why you should stay true to your wife, etc. So you read that and you go, all right, well, whatever we're going to see... He's definitely going to illustrate that. But the scene where Jiang Xingge's wife, Sanqiar, is 
sleeping with this other guy is not what you would expect given this introduction. It's lusty. It's extremely lusty. A lot of graphic details. Can we? Yeah, I, I, so, so because we need to sell this podcast, I think, and I think there nothing sells like porn. So let me just go over some of the details really quickly, because it's totally literary. I mean, it's it's very relevant. So um, essentially, what happens is this guy. What's his name? Chen Dalong. So Dalong, excuse me. So the character who sleeps with Zhang Xinge's wife is Cheng Dalong, and. He hires a woman to be a go-between. This Which was a common convention in yeah. Chinese fiction. And this woman sells pearls, and she kind of insinuates her way into this household. We won't get into the details. But the woman sleeps in the same room as Sanchar. And Who's the wife? Who is the wife. And eventually, this old lady, the go-between, and Sanchar are talking, and... The old lady says, oh, you know, it must be so hard not having your husband here. You know, I actually used to know, I know a way that you can kind of please yourself without your husband. And um, she, contrary to opinion, doesn't go, oh my gosh, that's shocking. She says, let's, let's talk about this. Yeah. What is this thing? And so the, the go-between woman lets her, let's... Um, Chen Dalong into the house. As the lights are out as and as San Xiar has gone to bed so that Granny Xue can show her how this works. Granny Xue, the go between. And so then Granny Xue just sets it all up and uh, suddenly San Xiar is being is being violated by uh, Chen Dalong. Thinking it's Granny Xue. Sort of, but it's clear. which is disturbing on many levels. But whatever. But it's quite a graphic scene, it is. and then immediately after having been, I, I, I believe that's rape. That quali- in my book that qualifies as qualifies rape, rape to me. Uh, she goes, "Oh, I'm in love with you. You're so handsome." Which, by the way, for those those keeping score, that's not how it works in real life. That's not really how it works in real life. But as Dr. Marm Epstein, who's been helping us through this, commented. This is not an uncommon trope. Hmm. This idea of statutory or otherwise rape resulting in quote unquote a loving relationship. And this of course is an entire can of worms what the the idea of love or i in Chinese even means mm-hmm. in classical literature it's like something this. that Professor Epstein has been read Dr. Marm Epstein's books we'll just give her a shameless yeah. plug here we go. Anyway, um so you have this scene now if the story had some kind of narrative cohesion that connected to the introduction, the way you would expect it to, this would be the moment when the wife, Sanchar, would say, what have I done? I've ruined everything. But she doesn't. She doesn't. Know. This particular section is, in fact, and I'm going to use the word lovingly, described. It's, this is, there's nothing in the description of this tryst, this adulterous tryst, that is negative. In fact, it's described in lush, beautiful tones. Again, I, I want to get back to the pornography selling the podcast. Because the heck? Because <laughs> here's the thing. Here's, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I want to make a literary point. So, <laughs> I mean, these stories are being written in the Ming Dynasty. Mm. And what we're seeing is this explosion of vernacular True. fiction mm. that is commercial. And I think that this scene was put in there partially because mm. porn sells stories. True. I mean, True. chicks get clicks, as the internet knows. This thing, this is the this is the fifth, fourth, uh, this is the you know fourteen twenties Chinese version of chicks get clicks. I think there's something like that going on. So I can understand putting this in. Oh here. yeah, but it totally. It's like a totally different narrator. Like that guy at the beginning who was moralizing mm. on us is now like kind of like selling us this pornographic work. And so one of the one of the things that's tricky to process is is the opening serious or is it ironic? Because you, you put in a more I I you know, given the quality of the writing, I'm gonna argue ironic. <laughs> But I'm not as I'm not well read enough in Huaban literature yet to you know speak to this authoritatively. But um, obviously, the listener is. the story is very well structured. Yeah, it's even fairly heartwarming at the end because there's there's a reconciliation of sorts between Zhang Xinge 
and Sanchar at the end of the story, which, again, is not what you would expect. So this is the disagreement that we had. Rob and I were not quite on agree. I mean, we, we disagreed on this point. I mean, I see that there is some interesting structures, but narrative-wise, I feel like the story just meanders at certain points, and it doesn't move forward. There were points I was asking, why is he telling me this? And again, I, the, the reason I disagree with Lee on this is the assumption that the story itself is only a certain series of events. Mm. That the story, the overarching story, or what Mike Ball would call the sort of the meta story. Wouldn't that be, is that technically a fabula? I don't think it's a fabula. Fabula is the experience of the characters okay. in the story, what they experience in the story itself. The stuff. Um, but when it's something like this, the actual writer of the story is involved in the story. Mm. Um, there's no other way to look at it. It's like having a translator. Um, the translator is involved in the story. And we should point out, at the beginnings of paragraphs in this story, quite often, mm. you'll have the narrator interject something like, we're not going to discuss this, or take a look at this. Or, audience. wow, that was a good idea. You yeah. know, something like that. Stuff it's like very that. strange. Yeah. Um, it almost reads like a, an oral tale in some ways. But it's clearly not. I think we can agree. No, I would agree with that. It's way, I, I think it's way too long and well-developed for an oral tale. I anyway, agree with you. Um, I like the reading of this opening as ironic because what it does then is it creates dramatic tension as you read because you read this opening and an opening like this or what they call in chinese sort of like an entry point is very common but then you're what you just read you will expect to see carried out exactly mm -hmm. right and here it is not or at all you i mean there are lots of cases in chinese like pusong where that's not a character. I haven't read Fusong Ling, so there you go. I stand correct. I clearly don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway. <laughs> I don't... I don't I, I'm... <laughs> now, the, the reason this story makes better sense to me if the opening is ironic is because if it's not, that points to um, just a total lack of ability as a writer. Hmm. You think... Fumble? Because clearly the scene of this tryst is written... In either an approving way, or at the very least, a, a an accomplished way. I mean, this is this is good narrative. Yeah. Um, and within the structure of the story, the moment works, right? Um, even in terms of karmic retribution, which we talked about before, the idea that what goes around comes around. Essentially, Zhang Xingge breaks the morning period and just to sleep with his wife. Uh, and then, in turn, he leaves her for business reasons. And even in romantic comedies today, if someone says, well, I don't have time for you. I have business to take care of. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Right? Um, and so you have this moment. What's so incredible about this story is you have this karmic retribution, sort of, because these bad things happen to people who don't observe the proper Confucian rights. We're using karma and Confucian terms uh, in a way that is very Chinese, I think. We're right. mixing these two very different ideologies. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting about this story is it doesn't end with the woman either being murdered or committing suicide. The Which woman, most of these stories would end that way. Right. The woman sort of lives happily ever after, kind of, though she never bears a son. Mm. Which actually some, I, I think a Chinese reader at this time, thinking about this story, could say <laughs> that's, you know, a punishment for being too lusty on both, on, on behalf mm -hmm. of both Zhang Xingge and San Chan. Right. So there is that form of punishment. She's not able to bear a progeny, but... Which we should point out to so the magistrate that we briefly mentioned, who's right. not really a main character. He gives away San Chan just freely, uh... And then immediately his next wife or his next concubine and give, bears him several sons. Right. Which means he gets, you know... The karmic reward. Yeah, exactly. Um, but for me what that points to is a very canny narrator. He's playing off of what readers would expect and then giving us something a little bit different at the very end. Um, because you couldn't say up front, for example, I'm going to tell you a story where lust doesn't really work out, but where things kind of work out in the end anyway, one way or the other. Hmm. You can't say that in a Zhu in an opening like this. T 
to, so to set it up ironically means to have the audience ready to go for you know whatever you set up in the in the, in the moralizing introduction, and then the payoff is actually something completely different. So that's how I read it. That, that's the way the reason I prefer the ironic opening because I when you read Feng Menglong, you don't get the the idea that he's just incompetent. He really is a very canny reader of these texts. Like you say, he knows what's going to sell. Yeah. There wasn't this long sort of pornographic scene in the original. He put that in himself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the way I would imagine Shakespeare put in, say, The Witches of the Cauldron or something else. You know what's These guys sell. are not only canny and, like, amazing at literature, they're businessmen. That's right. That's right. So you have a little bit of market economics playing in here as well, but... Mentioning market economics, I think that's interesting because there's this trope of the pearl yes. being tossed about as this thing of value, but this thing that is also valueless, mm -hmm. that's so valuable that it doesn't have value. And women are being traded as if they're goods in this mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. That's almost, I mean, we're seeing the sort of first, I mean, the story is to a certain degree marketed to people who are at least somewhat connected to the market economy that's mm -hmm. blooming in merchants China. and what merchants. yeah not necessarily to merchants themselves but to people who are connected to that right right so, so parting thoughts get a copy of the story it's a good story it's not very long you could read it in you know an hour less yeah. than an hour um and it's an interesting one to read and we'll talk more about this as we talk about more huaban later um there's a reason why writers in the early 20th century in China believed that there had not yet been a truly vernacular literature. But I think the story belies. I mean, it, 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 puts, it puts that lie out. Well, us. what I would argue as my final thought is what they're arguing is not that there's no vernacular literature. Mm -hmm. Like if you think of literature as a small word, they're thinking of literature as an art form. As sort of quote unquote high literature, vernacular hasn't yet been used in a high cultural way. It's only been used to tell pornography and sell books. This is the way they would read it, I think. So we can talk more about that later because I think it's an interesting discussion. Uh, if you've never read this stuff before, when you do, like for me, it was fairly surprising to see just how vernacular and yet how involved a piece of writing it was because I'm only used to reading literature post-1919. Yeah, I mean, I think for someone who's used to reading modern Chinese literature, this is not mm -hmm. really that hard. No, it's not. So I think that's a great thought to end on. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have anything else to that's say? That's it. That's what I got. Great. So I'm Lee. And I'm Rob. And this is the China Literature Podcast. <laughs>